freelancing freelancing change my life. Don't actually be a freelancer. Okay. Assume that you are not a freelancer. Assume that you are the business owner. What are the top mistakes you know, freelancers make? Dear sir slash madam, <laughs> being number <laughs> one. It's absolutely terrible. And if anybody who is watching or listening to this uh, has ever written that in their cover letter, then please never do it again. Otherwise, I will spank you personally. I'll come. I quit my job. Quit my job. Quit my full time job. The top mistakes is treating this like a salary job. Freelance is not a salary job. I won't get into which demography is the most painful to work with. French, easy. <laughs> on Upwork, it's all about can you be the person, that magic person that I'm, I've been looking for in the entire world because you can literally be anywhere in the world. I know freelancers in India, Pakistan, Thailand, Philippines, South Africa that have all made over a million dollars on Upwork. Wow, it's a big amount, yeah. It's tremendous. It is Life unreal. Life-changing, yeah. Life-changing, yeah. exactly. You only get there by being the person who is truly the best, who knows how to speak to clients better, who knows how to tap into what it is that they actually want. But when you nail it, you nail it. As long as you can keep delivering excellent results and focus on that, the sky is literally the limit. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fireside Chats. Today, we have with us one of the highest earning individual freelancers worldwide on Upwork. At one point in time, he was the number one. In his first four years as a freelancer, he earned a whopping 1.6 million USD on Upwork, Fiverr and Toptal. Nowadays, he helps freelancers on his YouTube channel called Freelance MVP. I'm talking about none other than Evan Fisher. Evan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rupam. Great to be here. Evan, there is so much more to you. Uh, please uh, tell us more about yourself and, of course, freelance MVP. Sure. So, uh, best to start at the beginning. Uh, when it, uh, well, it was, let's see, 2017, I I got fired from a job. And I was in the middle of, of Spain. And there was absolutely no way that I was going to get uh, another job for anything uh, of uh, of reasonable salary and i had a wife and a daughter uh three month old at that time to take care of and i was like okay how am i going to make this work ultimately i found uh, freelancing was uh, a, a thing that i could do and so i had to make this work because we have rent to pay and mouths to feed so um uh, that's where it all started and it grew to the point that as you said, uh, I made over $1.5 million in my first four years on Upwork, and I've continued to grow since, uh, both inside and outside of uh, Upwork, TopTel, Fiverr, uh, and my own business, uh, working directly with clients. Uh, and as a result of that journey, one of the things that I, uh, one of the things that I noticed was there's just not anything really out there from people who know, who have earned, who have grown themselves and who have actually done it that can give new freelancers and, and people who want to grow the, the means to do this themselves. And that was just the, the biggest problem that I saw of like, why is no one talking about this? Why is no one helping others to, to, to figure this out for themselves and to realize that, hey, this is something that you can do no matter where you are in the world. And so that's right. where Freelance MVP was born. And that's where we find ourselves today. Wonderful. My natural question at this point is like, how did you make so much money? And of course, do you remember your first dollar that you made as a freelancer? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So the how it, it, it starts, it's, it's like, a, you know, drips of water, right? Drips of water that, that drip, drip, drip into uh, a very small puddle. And then the flow of the water increases a little bit and that puddle turns into a, a, a larger puddle that then can grow into a pond that turns into a little trickle of a stream. And then eventually, if you take it far enough and you know increase the water flow enough, it will turn into a river, right? And that's, that's how it, it went for me as well. I am the sort of person where if I'm going to do something, then I want to do it to the extreme, 
and I want to do it to the absolute maximum, um, you know, minimum, uh, like min maxing, if you've ever heard the term, uh, minimum amount of, of input for the maximum amount of output. And so my niche in growing my own, you know, freelance career is corporate strategy, capital raising, management consulting, right? Uh, there's a lot of people that are in that niche that do all different things. Um, you know, some successful, some not so successful. Uh, but I wanted to be the absolute number one worldwide. And that was always my goal of, I want to grow to surpass absolutely anybody else. And I, I want to be the biggest and best, not just on Upwork, but, uh, you know, outside of Upwork and outside of all of the different platforms that I was on. And so that, that took time. I mean, the first job that I did, it was, it was $200. This is not, you know, we are starting absolutely at the top and doing the biggest jobs. And everything. no, I started the first job that I did that $200 job. I was doing the job for $200 that anybody else for a normal price would be charging 1500. So it was super low priced and I was doing work, not for free, but for very, very cheap for you know good a good quality job because so I was doing it for the review. And the way that I got it was when I had signed up for Upwork, I was like, I gotta take anything because I I gotta just start making money. And I had heard, okay, the 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 way to do it is you have to build up like a basis of of like reviews and you know and and that unlocks somehow, right? Like dark magic, uh unlocks the bigger jobs for you. Build the basis of reviews show clients that you know you're a real person and that you do a good job and that will unlock the the bigger jobs for you that was absolutely true and what i ended up doing was going from that $200 job into something that turned into a $1000 job that, and then another one that turned into a $2000 job and sort of snowballed my way up by just making sure that everything that i do I'm going to deliver excellence and I'm going to be able to make that person on the other side just so happy that, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that I found this person to be able to do this thing for me because it's awesome. As long as I could deliver that consistently, then I knew that I would never have like a hiccup of like a bad review right. or somebody that was unhappy. It's you know just making sure that if you say that you're going to do something, you do it and you crush it. You know, yeah, and you crushed it. You reached at the very top. Uh, you know, it it brings me, you know, to a book that I recently read. It's called "So Good They Can't Ignore You" by Cal Newport. He mentions yeah. that you know one should take to freelancing only when they have perfected their niche. Till then, they should work full time, whatever they're doing, as a salaried person. So, I mean, first of all, do you agree with this statement? This sentiment? That's it's an interesting one. It really is an interesting one. So the working full time until you actually, you know, have what have the skills that, that you, you know, want to, to generate, that is a possibility. That is a way. I don't necessarily think it's the only way. Example. I am terrible at Photoshop. Absolutely terrible. Really, okay. really, really bad. I always wanted to be able to do it. And I always figured like, oh my gosh, this should be so simple. I feel like I should be able to do this. And I, I need it in my daily life, um, at, you know, in terms of content creation. I always need to create something or at least show somebody who is a capable graphic designer, here's what I want. And meanwhile, I'm, I'm giving stuff to, to a graphic designer that I am literally mocking up in PowerPoint with like, you know, circles and shapes and writing all over it to try and describe what it is that I want to achieve, right? It's a big problem for me. I'm like, you know what? How hard would it be really to get the skills that I need to at least get in the realm of I could deliver something that is pretty good? How long would it take me? The answer was 24 hours. Wow. Watching YouTube and practicing just 24 hours of concerted effort of first seeking what is good, what is 
not even what is good, what is awesome. And how can I replicate that? And how can I get at least 85% of the way there to deliver something that is awesome, at least 85% of awesome in a short period of time? 24 hours was literally all it took. Wow. So you clearly don't agree with uh, Mr. Cal Newport. So, um, I mean, speaking of, you know, I don't, uh, I think that, I think that you can do it. It's the, the thought is right. Like you want to have the skills before you tell somebody that you have the ability to go and do something for them and accept money for it. I have a, I would have a big problem and I, I turn away about 85% of clients just because I know what it is that they need. I understand what they need, but I'm not the person to give them what they need. And I'm not going to take their money and tell them that I'm going to do something um, uh, unless I have the confidence that they will be able to get the result that they want to get after working with me. Right. So the the thought behind it of what Cal Newport is saying is uh, of, of generating those skills before you go out and do that, I agree with. But what I don't agree with is that you have to get a job first in order to do that. I think, and I've at least proven it for myself, I know that in order to be able to do a job that I would be able to charge probably on the low end, $75 an hour for graphic design, for an extremely specific niche, yeah, I, I've been able to learn personally those skills in 24 hours. And anybody else can do that because it's free. It's on YouTube, right? It's there. You just have to, you know, have the concerted effort to do it. So before you get become a freelancer and you need the skills, yes. Do you need a job to get there? Absolutely not. Right. So when you say that, you know, you turn down 85% of, you know, the requests that come to you, are you saying that yep. in a way to, you know, grow as a freelancer, you need to know which opportunities opportunities to pick and which to oh, say absolutely. no to, right? Because a lot yeah. of people at the bottom rung who are in the need of work, they just say yes to everything, but they don't, mm-hmm. you know, filter out as they grow, right? Yep. Yeah, that's that's a huge problem for a lot of beginner freelancers. You take what you can get. And I myself am guilty of this as well. Okay. Just I have taken jobs uh, because I knew that I needed the money, but at least you know, I went in with open eyes of like I am doing this for the money. I know that I'm it's not the perfect mm. fit, but I'm doing this for the money. And I know that I'm probably going to have to bend over backwards because it's not the most perfect fit. I can make it fit but it's not perfect. It's not ideal, but I will do my best to make sure that I'm delivering that person a really fantastic result in, in the end. But the problem is when people are okay with just taking things on and just saying, yeah, sure. I'll do it. No problem. That becomes a really big issue. You are the only person standing between yourself and a, a potentially like freelance career ending bad review. And so you have to be the person who guards yourself against that and who makes sure that you're not, you're only going to be doing jobs where you know, you can knock it out of the park, either do it something that's going to be excellent or don't ever promise that person that you're going to do something for them. It's as simple as that. A lot of people get sucked into that trap, especially in the beginner, uh, beginner area things. Yeah, and they don't get out of that phase easily. So Mm-mm. that's also there. You're yeah, speaking of, you know, um, the platforms, Upwork. You, you know, you're mm-hmm. an expert on that. So give us your top three advice, tips, mantras, mm-hmm. anything. Yeah. So there's a couple of things, and these are all things that we, you know, teach about in a lot more detail in inside of our course. Um, but there's a couple things that are really, really important for Upwork. And it kind of goes across the board for for everything else, although all the other parts of life as well. Cover letters. You have to make a good first impression. And so in making that good first impression, it's, you know, a lot of people assume, especially in their early days and just when they were a beginner, they assume that my cover letter is my show of interest for this job, saying that I can do it right? That's the thought. Really though, if you want to win the job, just the fact that you have sent a a cover letter, the fact that you have, you know, press send on that, 
that tells me you're interested as a client. Um, and I understand that you would like the job and that you are interested in having this job. The question is the other part, how interested and how motivated are you to actually do this job? How, how much work are you planning on doing? How motivated are you to deliver a fantastic result? And what proof do you have to offer that you can deliver an outstanding result? That's what you're trying to get across in a cover letter. Not, Hey, here I am. I'm interested and can do the job. Like, yeah, sorry, that's bullshit. That's, that's, that doesn't tell anything that doesn't add any value. Got it. Uh, but it, it's, it's extremely important to understand that people are looking for something different. If you actually want to win the job. Uh, the second piece, you have to search for unbelievable work examples. And this applies for every single niche across the board. Uh, people need to see, not just understand uh, or, or you know, you assume that they're going to get it of what is valuable about the work that you do. It requires seeing through what the state of job is into what does the person actually want. So example, you give me a job. You say, Evan... I would like for you to create a, a a photoshopped image, right? For that I'm going to use in Facebook ads, right? And so if I'm, you know, a basic beginner freelancer, then I'm just going to make an image and do what you tell me to. And that's all good. And yep. okay, there needs to be a person and a car and this, and we'll put it together. And I send it across to you and hope for the best. Hope that you think that that's good. Now, if I'm an advanced level freelancer and or a pro freelancer, then I need to know, okay, what is going to be the best kind of image or what's going to get you the result that you want, what you actually want. You don't actually want an image. You want an ad that performs and that makes you money and that grows the, <laughs> the number of people that are hitting your website or that are you know buying what it is that you have to sell. That's what you actually want. And so you know, the, the, the image that I'm creating is just one, you know, small piece of that. But if I can understand that that's the thing that you really want, then we're really talking. So understanding what good looks like and what awesome looks like and what the best in the world looks like and showing that you can do that. That's the, that's, that would be the second thing. The third thing, it's very simple. Re reviews are worth their weight in gold. Um, five stars, only and it you got to be the one who makes the decision of is this a good client or a bad client yeah. and know what all the signs are in between absolutely and you know speaking of cover letters they get so much heat especially let's say on linkedin oh yeah the people just they don't understand the utility of it so i'm glad that you touched upon that so um speaking of mistakes what are the top mistakes you know freelancers make uh, dear sir slash madam <laughs> being number <laughs> one, it's absolutely terrible. And if anybody who is watching or listening to this, uh, has ever written that in their cover letter, then please never do it again. Otherwise I will spank you personally. I'll come, <laughs> uh, really though, the, the top mistakes is treating this like a salaried job. You know, freelance is not a salaried job. You eat what you kill and, you have to be more clever than the next person. And so, yes, that requires constantly shifting your strategy. There are a couple of core things, fundamentals that don't change. But if you are writing as you would maybe to like HR or actually to a hiring manager, listen, there is no hiring manager on, on Upwork or, or Fiverr or whomever. You're speaking to the person who makes the decision. So, you you have to write to them as they make that decision and convince them to make that decision to hire you. Um, beyond that, it's not going for quality sooner. Being comfortable with, I'm going to deliver this level of, of quality and this is my process and I'm going to churn through it. There's a big difference between uh, Fiverr and Upwork and TopTel and it's level of expectation of quality that you'll receive as a client. Now, I've done the analysis, run the numbers and everything. Uh, the average client on Upwork spends around about 10 times what the average Fiverr client 
is going to spend in a given year 10 times. So, and, and that number, by the way, for Upwork is over $5,000 a year. For Fiverr, the average buyer is spending 500. So there's a huge gap in what the average client wants to pay. They want to pay people more. And that's an interesting thing because when you are the person who is offering quality and trying to be, I want to be the number one in this space, Upwork rewards that. Fiverr is a different game. It's a very different game. Uh, I have some friends who know that uh, a lot better. But uh, on Upwork, it's it's all about can you be the person, that magic person that I'm, I've been looking for in the entire world? And that really is true because you can literally be anywhere in the world. I know, uh, I know freelancers in India, Pakistan, Thailand, Philippines, uh, South Africa that have all made over a million dollars on Upwork. Wow. Really? And I mean, a, a million dollars in, in, in South Asia or Southeast Asia or Oceania it's a big in some amount, countries. Yeah. It's tremendous. It is Life unreal. Yeah. Life yeah. change, exactly. And the thing is, you only get there by being the person who is truly the best, who knows how to speak to clients better, who knows how to tap into what it is that they actually want. But when you nail it, you nail it. As long as you can keep delivering excellent results and focus on that, the sky is literally the limit. You can be living like a king. Do you want to get there? Right. That's the only question. Are you motivated? Um, because if you're if you get stuck in that that you know hamster wheel of the grind of of just producing low quality work, you'll end up having a short career on Upwork. So right. that's that's one of the that's one of the things I think that is a mistake that people fall into. But then also that the the, um, the unlock that gets you on that path to to being in the one percent of, of of freelancers. Right. We are speaking with a one percenter here, one of the at least number one uh, creator at one point in time. So you're the perfect pers person to answer the following question. What does it take to make it to the top? I always boil it down to this. Like there's a lot of different things, a lot of different things. And I, I have them actually written because I'm going to be recording a video for the YouTube channel pretty soon. Uh, I'll, I'll, I can you know run them down for you yeah, and, and they're all fine and good. Uh, number one, don't actually be a freelancer. Okay. That's Assume that you are not a freelancer. Assume that you oh. are the business owner of a company that is to be and you are managing that brand's name and keeping that brand's name pristine that you will never have anyone you know behind your back or anywhere else be speaking bad about you because you only have delivered truly excellent work and been an, a consummate professional the entire way along so assume that you're never going to be a freelancer that you are just a growing business owner then don't fail just don't ever fail. And that's where client vetting comes into play. You have to know what all the signs and all the red flags are. Uh, you know, case in point, if you hop on a call with somebody and it turns out that they're in their car, that may seem like a small thing, may seem okay, may seem perfectly fine. But the subtext of it is, Shipham, I don't respect you. I, yeah. I don't I don't care enough about your time to be sitting in a single place and speaking with you quietly and thoughtfully and be focusing on you. So I'm actually focusing on driving and not killing myself. So it's avoiding anybody who has those red flags and never getting stuck in those traps. Uh, then making it easy on yourself to win clients. That's where what we spoke about with cover letters comes in. And there's a number of other rules, but it all comes down to the relentless pursuit of delivering excellence to people and understanding what it is that they're truly after. Not what they want you to do, but what they're trying to do with what it is that you're going to do for mm. them. What do right. they really want to achieve? Get to that and, and you're killing it. 
uh, you're not even in the one percent. You're in the point zero one percent. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So speaking of you know these red flags, can you you know give us more examples? Because one of the red flags that I you know uh, I have found is that people not switching on their cameras in one-on-one meetings, mm-hmm. and uh, sometimes you know. The communication is not clear. They themselves don't know what they're doing. So how do you empathize enough with a client so that you know what they are trying to achieve? Because you have mentioned this a couple of times now. It's not about what mm-hmm. they want. It's about what they want to achieve. So how do mm-hmm. you get to that? Okay. Uh, do you have any kids? Mm, do you have no. any children? Okay. No. Uh, you know how children operate though, right? Yeah. When you And I'm sp- speaking specifically about figure a three-year-old. Right, yeah. where a, a three-year-old and a parent, where you're going out and you're trying to to get something. Let's say you're going shopping or something, and the three-year-old sees something and they say, "I want that." What happens next is definitive. Who is in control of that situation? Either the parent or the toddler. It cannot be both, right? Yeah. So somebody is in control uh, of that interaction. It's it's very much the same in freelancing too. Either it is you who is in control or you are letting somebody else take the wheel. And it doesn't mean that you should be uh, you know, grabbing every single conversation by the horns and saying, okay, here's where we're going to go. But rather being the gentle guide and the steady hand of I am the professional. I know exactly what it is that we're going to be doing. I have a process and either you fit into it as a client or we're not working together. We're just not going to be a good fit. And that's okay. Now, the red flags, once you define your own rules of what makes for a good client and what is acceptable for you and what is unacceptable for you, and you know which direction you're going to go, uh, then it's the question of who fits into that box and and who doesn't. For me, uh, there's a number of red flags and then there's a number of yellow flags. Red flags, deal breaker. Forget it. We're not working together. These are things like if you show up, uh, let's say, six minutes late to a 10-minute call and have not sent no email, no nothing uh, in advance, or you show up to a call with me uh, unprepared and have, having not done your homework, having not watched through any of the things that have been sent to you in advance, um, you know, basically getting you ready for that conversation. Um, then yeah, forget it. We're not working together. Red you flag. just aren't prepared to put yeah. in the homework that you will need because here's what happens next, right? There's little things that are markers of a much bigger, uh, symptoms of a much larger disease. Let's say little thing, uh, you know, sorry, I didn't read your email. That's the little thing. The much bigger piece of it is assume that we work together and you have paid for something and you expect work to be done in four weeks. However, if you as a client don't show up when I need you to do something specific and give me some input on a couple of very specific questions, but you're just too busy. You're you know doing your own thing, not providing information. You are probably going to ghost me. If you don't do your homework, then you're definitely not going to do you're it. Once do you that. feel entitled yeah. and have made payments toward me, it's the expectation of, oh, but you're going to go and do it. You're going to go and do it. There is no way in that scenario then that I can guarantee somebody a win. And so with that red flag, forget it. There are also yellow flags. Uh, many of them that on their own, not necessarily a deal breaker, but definitely causes questions. So uh, yellow flags might be things like uh, I showed up to to a call and that person is asking for a discount, right? Asking mm, for a discount okay. in, in and of itself, you know, it's, it's normal in a lot of cultures. It's normal. Like you, you know, yeah. uh, in some cult, it's just expected of, of course, yeah. I'm going to ask you for a discount. doesn't mean that you're going to get it, but there's a line there. It's a yellow flag when it's asked for of like, okay, what about a discount? But if it's, I would like a discount. Uh, and also I would like to, you to do more work, uh, you know, for, for that same price. And on top of that, I have, you know, a hundred other projects for you to do. 
then you're promising me a bunch more work. But the first one that we're going to do is going to be at cut rate and I'm expected to do more work for it. All of those things together, that adds up. Multiple red, yellow flags add up to one red flag, right? Now, the other side of that is if it's just, hey, listen, you know, Chapam, can you uh, can you give me a discount? And, you know, I, I have to ask, uh, you know, yeah. you never know what you can get. And, hey, maybe you're feeling like a nice guy that day. Maybe you're like, OK, you know, it's 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 a nice way of doing it. And, OK, let's maybe do a deal. I like this person. Yellow flag. But you know what? Totally fine, because all the rest is really cool. And everything right. else is really relaxed. And there's no insisting of like, you have to give me a discount. Otherwise, we're not working yeah. together. Nope. No, I don't. Because we won't work together in the first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I understand the cultural aspect of it. Because, you know, I've mm -hmm. done some freelance work on my own. So yep. there is, you know, uh, under, you understand like uh, the demography of your, you know, let's say the clients that you're targeting. Oh, yeah. So I, I wouldn't. I won't get into that, you know, like which demography is the most painful to work with. But there are, uh, you know, cultural differences French, that come easy. in the way. <laughs> My background is um, in international um, in international corporate finance and, and M&A, doing cross-border transactions, you know, from one country to another. And um, only uh, where we've got one country working with another country, right? Right. Um, I've worked with a lot of cultures all around the world. Uh, basically clients from about 150, no, not 150, more like 120 countries. So, uh, you know, it's, it's <laughs> something that I, I, I can say with, you know, pretty good accuracy. Experience. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, Evan, one of the things that we do on the show is we ask for our guests to give a breakdown, breakdown of their revenue with numbers mm -hmm. if they are comfortable. So would you like to share all your revenue streams with us at this point you have? Um, yeah, at this point, it's so we, we've got uh, and can't give exact numbers, just to be honest. Yeah, I'm, sure. I, I don't I don't track them in 100 uh, um, percent. As far as. Let's see, on one side of things, we've got um, uh, Upwork uh, work that, that I do, which probably makes up about I don't know, maybe 30% of, uh, of, of the work that I do. And then the other 70%, um, is going to be direct clients that, that we work with, uh, through unicorn, just people that, uh, that I've worked with for, for years at this point. Um, then beyond that, uh, Fiverr and top tail making up, um, a minimal proportion, less than 5%, um, on an ongoing basis of the revenue on that side of things, uh, from the, uh, freelancer training side, uh, that's, that's growing. Uh, and you know, on, on that front, we're looking at just early stage of, of growth. We're probably just about to break mm, 2,500 a month. I mean, and, and you know, with, with intention because we want on that front, it, want it to be approachable for people, just not right. to be hard to sign up, not have a huge cost barrier of entry because a lot of people that are trying to freelance across the world are building up from nothing. Right. Yeah. And are just starting, don't have a huge budget to be, you know, spending on just learning how to do this right. Even though the ROI is tremendous, um, where we just had our first person break a million dollars in earnings that has come through the course. So, uh, and on top of that, he made his last hundred thousand in two months, which is nuts. Wow. It's un <laughs> unbelievable. Um, but nonetheless, that's, that's got to fit for, for everybody. So on that front of things, we're literally just getting started and seeing a lot of green shoots and a lot of people joining up, um, all the time. So, um, on that front, if I had to guess, uh, I don't know, we probably in an average month are doing about 40,000. Um, and then on, on the courses side of things, uh, yeah, around about 2,500 and, and growing. Wonderful. 
Evan Fisher, thank you so much for coming on the show, giving us all the insightful, you know, uh, things and your views mostly. And uh, thank you for supporting freelancers. And if you have anything else Happy to say to freelancers, which I didn't ask you, now's the time to say that. Awesome. Well, the one thing that I would say is maybe a, a word of motivation. Absolutely. You can do it. You who are watching, you who are listening, you can do this too. I am not special. I am not some wonderful person. I am just a guy who happens to have figured out a system of how it works, maybe better than anybody else, and have just packaged it into the step-by-step -step process of what you need to do in order to do the exact same thing and grow your own, your own uh, success. But the thing is, you can do it too, and people everywhere like you, as long as they've got the motivation and desire to push for consistently delivering excellence, you can do the exact same thing. Um, and I hope that you do. And the way that I would go about that is by checking out freelancemvp.com, check out our course. But if you're not ready for that, then we've got a lot of free stuff on YouTube, and that's where I would get started. Um, the choice is yours of whether you want to, uh, to lean into this, but the thing is you can do it. You heard that from a top 0.1 person creator. So go check out freelance MVP. We'll also provide a link to the channel as well as the website. Evan, thank you so much. Uh, last ritual we make our guests go through. Would you like to nominate anyone for the show? Absolutely. I would. Like I said, I'm not special. I know some other people who are though. Uh, I would like to nominate. How many people can I nominate, Jamal? You can nominate three, five. Okay, because I've got five. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> all right, all right. And uh, the the upside is uh, all of them have made over half a million on Upwork. Uh, all of them have their own separate successful businesses in all different areas, marketing automation, in tech development, in graphic design. Uh, they're all superstars and they're all just a couple of friends of mine. So I would nominate Ross Jenkins of Digital Me, uh, Josh Burns of Josh Burns Tech, superstar uh, uh, creator on, on YouTube. He's got over 100 and I think 125,000 subscribers at this point. Uh, Morgan Overholt, uh, she's a graphic designer. Uh, she's done over 600,000 on Upwork. Uh, Adam Palmer, who has a killer marketing automation agency. He's done over, I believe he's broken 2 million at this point in his agency. And um, Courtney, um, oh man, I, I really, I'm, I'm going to uh, be a terrible person. I'm going to have to, uh, double check her last name. Uh, but Courtney um, Allen, who has also done over 2 million on Upwork, graphic designer, and, sh and she's a killer as well. Uh, all of those people, you'd love to have them. And listen, if you're the sort of person that wants to hear more about this from other successful people, then you better be coming on back because those are the ones yeah. that you want to be listening to as well. So now you know the names of the people you'll be seeing on the show in the following episodes. We'd like to uh, thank Evan one last time for appearing on this show and creating all those wonderful videos on his YouTube channel. Keep creating, Thanks, Evan. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely, I will. Same to you. Thank you. And cut. That's it for today's episode, guys. If you really liked it, please subscribe to the Thousand Faces Club and press the bell icon below so that you don't miss any videos from us. Thank you.